I want to welcome you to the last and fourth panel on inflation. Uh, we've heard a lot about inflation in the first two panels, both in the unemployment and job creation, as well as uh, the US macroeconomic outlook. The points of view were divergent, so I think um, we will have a different perspectives uh, in, this, in this panel. We are joined with uh, four panelists. I should say from the outset, uh, three of them are members of the Levy family. That is Jamie Galbraith, Randy Ray, and Yevon Nersidian. And um, I want to thank you, especially Isabella, because I know you're in Germany and the time there is quite late than what it is here. And we appreciate it very much uh, your participation. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Jamie Galbraith. I, I hope he is is on. I'm here. Hi, Jamie. Um, who uh, is yeah. a, um, a professor? He has the chair of Lloyd Benson um, of government uh, and uh, business in the School of Lyndon B. Johnson of Public Affairs. Um, he is very distinguished in having received a number of prizes and awards. But what's not listed in the program that you have is that um, he's a longtime senior scholar of the Institute and he's a member of our Board of Governors. So, um, Jamie, I want to start with you and then we'll go with to Isabella and uh, Randy and uh, Yeva who participate in the Q&A. Okay, uh, let me put this on here. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, first of all, just express my pleasure at being able to participate. And I would like to congratulate the, the, the Levy Institute for uh, this 30th uh, anniversary conference. It's quite a, quite a record. Uh, I, I'm uh, have been around long enough to have, remember when these conferences were held with real people in a, in a physically three-dimensional setting to, at Blythewood, but there, but it has to be said that Zoom has certain advantages. Um, and I also want to congratulate the earlier panelists on a chance to listen to a great deal of the of the day and for very timely and um, uh, really very well informed. Uh, presentations uh, filled with, uh, with with good information about the current state of the economy. This is not what I'm going to provide. Uh, I am going to uh, speak to the to some underlying theoretical questions, which have been around for a long time, but I think uh, to a certain degree still underpin some of the question, issues that we are uh, that we're we're trying to discuss here. Uh, so. Um, this is a based on a paper which was just published a few days ago, actually, in the in the review of Keynesian economics. Uh, 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 the first question I want to ask and uh, pose to my federal panelists is: What exactly is inflation? Um, to uh, senior advisors uh, to President Biden, one of them, Jared uh, Bernstein, a friend of, of many of us, uh, wrote the other day that, uh, or the last year or two years ago, that inflation is the rate of change of prices over time, which is a, a very prosaic uh, definition of the term. Um, and I think it is really, uh, it obscures, it may be useful for some purposes, but it obscures important questions. Inflation is not like unemployment. Uh, it is not something that you count. It's not something where there's a certain number of people out there. Uh, inflation is, uh, and unemployment is a, is a concept which is limited to industrial societies. You can't use it to describe the situation, for example, in a, in a third world or a peasant economy, for example. Uh, inflation, on the other hand, is something which can happen anywhere. It is measured by constructing an index number. It's essentially a theoretical idea. And so I would like to distinguish between two um, uh, this two, two quite different uh, notions of what inflation is. I'll call the first one pure inflation. That's a textbook concept. Uh, and we can describe this as being the undifferentiated devaluation of the monetary unit with respect to all newly produced goods and services. It's a basic idea that you'll encounter uh, when, uh, for example, you, you referenced to Milton Friedman's remark that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. 
uh, the real world contains very few and possibly no examples of pure inflation of this kind. Okay, maybe the influx of American gold and silver, mostly silver, to Europe in the 16th century constitutes a, an example which remains very strongly rooted in our minds, but that's not what we experience uh, on a characteristic basis in the modern economy. I'll I'll, I'll describe the other concept as, as everyday inflation. Uh, and everyday inflation is what we typically see. Uh, it's the propagation of some of a, of a an increase in prices, a shock, uh, from typically from one sector to, uh, or commodity or group of commodities through the structure of industrial and other prices in the economy. Very characteristically, the shock originates in the energy sector, which underpins a great many other things, uh, practically every other thing in the economy. Uh, the kind of inflation that we experience is always impure in the sense that it always affects distribution one way or another. It has strong effects on the structure of, of incomes. And it may or may not be something which is sustained. Uh, in the 1970s, which was the last time we really had to deal with these questions in a serious way, uh, there was a structure of staggered contracts in the, particularly in the in in the uh, heavily unionized industrial sectors, which tended to propagate and continue the propagation of inflation in this kind of inflation and price increases in the United States uh, over substantial periods of time. Something which was not true, for example, with Japan in those years, but was true in the U.S. and in the U.S. Okay. Uh, and uh, because of uh, uh, structural changes in our economy, it has not been seen uh, in the US economy since then. Uh, what actually happened in 2021 and 2022 uh, was a series of, of shocks that were quite specific uh, to changing conditions, especially closely related to the pandemic. And I'll just mention three of them. Uh, much of the information about this has already been uh, presented by other panelists early in the day. Uh, energy, driven largely by oil, was a sector where prices collapsed uh, in the pandemic, and then they began to recover. Uh, and they recovered uh, very sharply, and that's partly because uh, the demand for energy grew more rapidly than the supply. And that is partly because of the changing structure of ownership and corporate strategies in the oil producing sectors, particularly in the Permian Basin here in Texas. Uh, I have noticed this mainly in the local press and the Houston Chronicle in 2022 ran a story saying investors in oil and gas companies have been pushing for capital discipline and increased returns. The result is instead of spending to quickly ramped up production in oil fields such as the Permian, companies are sticking to already planned production increases, providing almost all, only modest relief to site supplies and high prices while passing on a good chunk of their blockbuster profits to investors. So you clearly had something of that kind going, the gas prices rose. Uh, to an average of $5 a gallon. Uh, second major area was uh, in, in automobiles. Uh, this was due to a, a shock to the supply of semiconductors, which is another story related to the very long production times in semiconductors and to the uh, uh, nature of the of their use in automobiles. The fact was that new automobiles became quite scarce. The used car market, therefore, had a very rapid and uh, run up in prices in this period. Um, Used cars, I should note, are not part of GDP. They're not newly produced. Um, and then there's housing, which also affects the consumer price index. Most of that is not newly produced. Uh, and their housing, which I, I gather from today's talk, is now around 40% of, of, uh, of the consumer price index. Uh, one has a lot of strange things, which I think need to be more better understood, I certainly better understood than I understand them, but in which, for example, rental contracts, which affect a very thin part of the housing market in the United States are essentially uh, imputed uh, to, the, uh, to the rents that homeowners pay to themselves. And this enters the CPI as a major component in the, in the measurement of inflation. Uh, but it's, uh, a, as I say, a thin tail, which appears to be wagging a very fat dog uh, and affecting the way in which we calculate these numbers. Okay. Uh, is this a persistent phenomenon? Well, there are some elements of it which 
take a certain amount of time to work through the system. And in particular, well, oil is a wholesale product. Uh, gasoline is a retail product. And uh, uh, oil prices went up for a certain period, but the gasoline prices continued to rise for a long period after that. So there's this kind of, of uh, let's say, lags in the pass through of a shock in the system, which can be taken for persistence, but I don't think it really qualifies as such. The more serious matter is a matter that's purely illusory, and it has to do with the fact that the inflation numbers are reported as the headline matter, as the they're characteristically reported as the uh, the, uh, the the previous the gain over the previous twelve months, uh, and that is very unlike unemployment. Unemployment is, is, is reported on a month-to-month -month basis. When you in, report inflation the way we do it, uh, what happens is that you it has the advantage of smoothing out volatility in what is a, a very difficult to measure statistical series. But it has an enormous disadvantage, which I state here is that of giving Larry Summers, Jason Furman, and Ken Rogoff eleven extra opportunities every with every shock uh, to write op-eds about how inflation is such a terrible persistent problem. Problem. Um, uh, there are some examples here that uh, here's here's Larry in May of 2021 talking about inflation resulting from savings, which is an interesting idea, uh, from debt purchases of the Federal Reserve. Another very interesting thought uh, from the forecasts uh, the Federal Reserve uh, staff is making, which gives the forecasters an enormous amount of power, and then from the fiscal stimulus, but then also from stock and real estate prices, which, so far as I know, are also not newly produced products. That's an interesting question as to why we're concerned about them as a source of, of, of inflation in, in some, some strict sense of that term. Here's Ken Rogoff and here's Jason Furman. Uh, Furman particularly laying on the in August of 2022, which was not so long ago, uh, increasingly clear the um, un underlying inflation rate is at 4% of it, more likely to be rising than falling. And the Fed will need to stick to its plan to raise of rapid interest rate heights. And in September, more of, of the same, I'm talking quite specifically about how high the unemployment rate would have to be. Uh, in 2023 in order to solve this problem. Well, his timing was excellent. Uh, just a few days after he made those remarks, uh, the, the air went out of the inflation balloon just a few days after the, not up quite uh, up short coincidentally after the 2022 election, the uh, press started reporting about how inflation was tailing off and those reports, uh, which have been, have been uh, accumulating and essentially been uncontradicted for the succeeding four or five months. Uh, so we've, Clearly, see where uh, the the uh, that there's something quite uh, wrong with the uh, with the way in which this phenomenon has been interpreted by some of the most prominent people in the economics profession. Uh, so let me go on here. I want to suggest that what's behind this is the fact that people have not quite outgrown the the. Uh, uh, intellectual constructs that they learned in graduate school, uh, and specifically three of them, uh, the Phillips curve conjecture, which was owing to Samuel Solo in 1960, and then based upon 1950s work on the United Kingdom in the late 19th century. Uh, and that then uh, evolved into the natural rate or, or NIRU hypothesis of uh, Ned Phillips in 67, Milton Friedman in 68, uh, which uh, I remember trying to, uh, trying to talk people out of at Levy conferences in the 1980s. Uh, and then uh, separately, that somewhat distinctly, I, I'm, I'm something I'll call the output gap model, uh, which uh, uh, allows for essentially as a device for allowing for some uh, legitimacy to a fiscal stimulus in response to uh, uh, a, a, a downturn in economic activity. And I'll come back to that momentarily. Uh, it is not as though these uh, here's, the, here's the Phillips curves for you in case uh, in case you need to be reminded of what they were, short-run Phillips curve with a trade-off between inflation and employment and this morphs into the long-term concept in which there's a, a natural rate which was always moving around but uh, was something that the policy could ostensibly do nothing about. Uh, uh, any of it. Uh, it's not as though these concepts were never challenged. Uh, I call your attention to a couple of articles in the uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives, one of them in 1997, uh, rather forcefully entitled Time to Ditch the Nehru, uh, and the other one by a much nicer man, uh, with a much gentler attitude toward these questions, asking it in a very cautious way. Should we reject the natural rate hypothesis? This is, of course, Olivia Blanchard, uh, writing in the same journal and 
I calculate, in fact, scientists tell me that there are 21 years uh, that have passed between my article and his, which, in which time I was able to raise two daughters to voting age and still not able to move the economics profession off of this <laughs> clearly uh, wrongheaded idea. But nevertheless, better late than never to begin raising questions at the peak of the mainstream. Okay, the output gap model, which is the, uh, uh, the other uh, uh, crutch on which mainstream economists have been relying on this in this area allows, as I say, for if you have a negative output gap for uh, a stimulus policy, but it also limits that policy in important ways uh, by uh, because of the implicit assumption, very clear in this loan diagram, that whatever you do, the economy is going to return to its long-term trend, and that is the best outcome you can hope for, and therefore any stimulus should be temporary, it should be carefully targeted, it should not involve major efforts, major or ambitious efforts, time-consuming efforts to change the structure of the economy, because those will inevitably uh, affect the system too late, uh, and so it I'd say very uh, limited, and I should say um, uh, a, a seriously problematic approach to the question of of what to do in the face of a serious downturn. It also ignores the fact that households are uh, can have a balance sheet rather than a behavioral response to increased uh, to 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 uh, uh, increase support from the from the federal budget, which is obviously something that did happen in the pandemic, and is something from which we have benefited very clearly over the past a uh, couple of years, as earlier commentators today have already said. Okay, uh, well, the sorry, the essence of this sorry uh, uh, has led to a attitude toward inflation uh, toward whatever kind of inflation we're experiencing, that it should be targeted, that the central bank is the appropriate institutional entity to do the targeting. Uh, why is that? Well, I can tell you as an old political economist that the main reason is that it's very helpful for people who are elected uh, to office, including the president and members of Congress, to pass the responsibility for inflicting pain onto somebody else who is not so easily displaced by the by angry voters. Uh, then there's the question of, um, of, of what level Level should inflation be targeted? I don't know where the 2% came from. I do know in some sense that it emerged out of the, 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 the ether of, the, of the certain people's minds some time ago. But I don't know that it has any foundation in, in the law, which I was partly involved in drafting the Humphrey Hawkins Law in the 1970s. And it seems to me arbitrary and capricious and uh, should be subject to careful review in light of any particular circumstances. How should the, the central bank implement this? This is always a question which has been somewhat vague. Uh, initially, when the, when, when the responsibility was handed over to the Fed in the late 70s and early 80s, the notion was they were going to control the money supply. That went out of the window very quickly in the early 1980s. Um, and we got something which is a combination of, uh, of, of interest rate control, which is what actually the instrument that they use, uh, plus something called forward guidance, which is what the, 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 the Fed tells us. And how it tells us is an interesting question. It basically operates through the congressional hearing process, something which fills me with a great deal of personal grief because uh, I was the person, the staff person responsible for setting up these hearings. Here we have Paul Volcker in the banking committee chambers with Wright Patman looking over his shoulder, that's in that portrait uh, behind him. Uh, and I'm undoubtedly on the dais behind the members on the other side. Those were, these were my hearings. And I had no idea at the time that they would become a kind of cult in the economics profession. Uh, so the vector by which Federal Reserve policy would be would, 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 would mysteriously control the psychology of the broad American public and set inflation expectations. So it seemed then, would have seemed then to me, seems to me now as a very strange and bizarre notion. But nevertheless, one has to bear historical responsibility, such as it is. We've already heard today uh, some talk about the, uh, what actually happened to households uh, when they received a good deal of, uh, of, uh, of, of cash inflow in the, under COVID-19. By a large, a fair uh, summary of it is that the vast majority continued doing what they would ordinarily do. Uh, they paid for their bills. Uh, and they, if they had something left, which many of them did for a certain period of time, uh, they they stored it up until they needed it. And this is not inflationary. This is basically a survival strategy uh, that should not be considered to be a driving excess demand. Uh, and the 
upper reach, uh, the top 20 or the, the second 20, 20 uh, quintile of the distribution. Uh, what appears to have happened is that expenses on services were sharply curtailed because they weren't available. And savings uh, that were that result were then channeled into uh, appliances, cars, real estate, stocks, and other assets. But this also is not inflation in any in any theoretically coherent sense of the term. It's uh, driving up the prices of fixed assets, which already existed. And the word for that, generally speaking, is boom, which may or may not be a good thing, but it's not to be should not be confused with inflation in theoretical terms. Well, the Federal Reserve reacted. Uh, they raised interest rates, which has had its effects on construction, stocks, other asset prices. The yield curve became inverted, something which has always in, uh, reliably in the past produced an eventual slump. The question of when that happens is an open question. And the Federal Reserve having reacted, again, largely in response to its, uh, its instincts and its habitual uh, uh, patterns of thought and the urging of mainstream economists, among other reasons, uh, is now basically on the uh, on the two prongs of a of a of a dilemma. It can stay the course, in which case eventually it will drive the economy off the cliff, or it can change the course, in which case it will have uh, very significant effects on the exchange value of the dollar. Let me just come back. Uh, here's the yield curve for you, just updated a few minutes ago. <laughs> and you can see uh, it, it does when it dips into into, into the in, in negative territory. It does so characteristically before a major slump. Uh, and right now, the real curve yield curve is rather impressively negative, even by historical standards. Uh, so uh, uh, buckle in. Uh, again, it's not clear exactly when that will hit, but it doesn't look good. Uh, are there still risks to prices? I would say yes, there are. Oh, one of them is that. Uh, in an environment in which the basic structure of prices has been destabilized, there's a tendency for any entity which has pricing power to use it, because at this point, the normal behavior, the habitual good behavior of corporations with respect to their customers is no longer applied. Uh, and this, I'll leave to Isabella to discuss, but uh, you know, it seems to me opens an opens a case for a strategy of control simply to set new norms that would then uh, help the authorities to stabilize uh, gross markups and what we can call basically a profit profit inflation. Uh, are there more energy shocks ahead? It's entirely possible, and there's an obvious need uh, for an energy policy that's also been discussed earlier in the day. Uh, an energy policy which is not only oriented toward the larger planetary needs, but also toward ensuring uh, that supplies are available in ways that are uh, that have uh, you know basically stable costs to allow businesses to operate in a normal way and to have a normal level of profits. There is also the risk that the interest costs that are being uh, inflated on businesses um, uh, will be passed through to prices. Interest, after all, is a cost. And so there's an obvious, uh, you know, let's say, counterproductive effect. How big it is, I don't want to get into, but a counterproductive effect in principle of the interest rate policy on prices. And then finally, there's this phenomenon of multipolarity or de-dollarization. And it's not obvious that there is a good response to that. Here is a, a chart that a friend of mine sent me a couple of days ago uh, that shows the path of the federal funds rate in the path of the dollar. And you can see that up until a certain point, let's say in the middle of 2022, uh, the effect of rising interest rates was in fact to defend the value of the dollar, but that does not seem to have been happening for the last six or seven months. Uh, and so the question of what leverage remains with the monetary authorities of the United States government generally over the fate of the dollar in the in the, in, the, in the world currency markets is, I think, an open question at this point. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, yes. I'm almost done. This is, I think, my last slide. There's just one other thing, and I wanted to be more up to date even than some of the earlier presenters. And this is the news from this afternoon about the, the, uh, the regional banking crisis. That's another threat uh, that uh, we perhaps ought to uh, bear in mind, particularly since it is, of course, the direct consequence of the Federal Reserve's so-called anti-inflation policy. Uh, it is absolutely the result of the very sharp increases of interest rates against the, uh, the, the investment strategies and lending strategies that the regional banks in particular had been pursuing uh, in the wake of the great financial crisis and the, and the, and the pandemic. And now uh, the, the, the piper is going to have to be paid on that. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very, very much, uh, Jamie. This is excellent. Um, Isabella Weber is a professor at um, uh, UMass at Amherst. She's a, she has a PhD from the New School of Social Research. She is a, um, a research associate at Fairbank Center at Harvard University and a Big Gruen um, Fellow at Peking University. She has a habit of collecting a number of prizes, uh, the John Robinson Prize and Keynes Prize and others. And that was because of her um, bestseller book on China, How Did China Avoid the Shock Therapy? So, uh, Isabella, uh, it's your turn. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be on this panel. Um, and it's uh, very humbling, in fact, to speak after Jamie. Um, the good thing is that I feel like he already said basically everything I wanted to say. So consider my presentation some sort of an empirical <laughs> elaboration on um, uh, the principles that Jamie has laid out. Um, I should also say and apologize, in fact, that since I'm in Berlin and I was just speaking at another big conference and it was running on and I couldn't wake my way back to my accommodation. So I'm now in a public space and I hope um, it will all work out. But just in case... Uh, um, my connection is not great or anything like that, please, please um, bear with me, but I'm optimistic that I'll make it. Okay, so the title of my presentation is Inflation in Times of Overlapping Emergencies, Systemically Significant Pr Prices, Profits, and Conflict. I would argue, and I'm probably um, uh, teaching to the choir here, that the vision of price stabilization and the great moderation was as if um, inflation works like a coin powered horse, um, where it's basically a one dimensional problem. It's either a problem of too much money chasing too few goods or a problem of the output gap. But in any case, it's a one dimensional um, issue where with some simple rules and some simple tools, you can make sure that this horse is never um, jumping over um, one end or the other of um, this uh, uh, bandwidth with, with, within which it's moving since that's how the horse is correct, co constructed. And it's very easy to know how to make sure that this is the case. I'm going to jump over all of this because this would be a repetition of what Jamie already said. So what I'm arguing is that we should be thinking about price stabilization in times of overlapping emergencies, rather like riding an actual horse where I'm not a very accomplished equestrian, but uh, while the shutdowns lasted, I started to take up <laughs> um, horseback riding in uh, Western Massachusetts. And if you go on a trail ride, you will never be able to control all the things that could um, trigger your horse um, to uh, spook. But there are certain things that you know will trigger your horse and that you can avoid, um, such as, for example, if there's um, someone on a bike, um, you might want to talk to that person so that this person reveals themselves as a human being rather than the horse thinking that this is a steel monster or something, which will be, make it likely for the horse um, to spook. So um, in parallel, I would argue that we, sorry, and I'm that, sorry, I'm having an issue. Here. In parallel, I would argue that we have to understand what are the things that can um, trigger inflation? What are the sectors that matter most for price stability? And hence, these are the sectors that we have to focus on um, if we want to achieve um, uh, price stability or at least some degree of price stability in a context of overlapping emergencies where um, climate change, um, the crumbling global economic order, um, and of course also still the pandemic um, might make it more likely that there will be new shocks to come forward. If we think of the economy as a circular flow, then prices are not simply connected by the budget constraints of individuals, but rather they are connected because one sector's prices are another sector's costs. Or to use Leon Tiev's own works, input-output analysis is a method of systemically quantifying the mutual interrelationships among the various sectors of a complex economic system. The effect of an event at any one point is transmitted to the rest of the economy step-by-step step via the chain of transactions that links the whole system together. Far from being independent of each other, the cost price structure of all the separate industries are nothing but links in a vast network which embraces the whole national economy. 
This then also means that there's an overall dependence among wage rates, profits earned, and taxes paid per unit of output in each of the many separate industries on the one hand, and the prices of all different kinds of goods and services sold by these industries on the other. So once we consider the economy as such a circular flow, we can then try to understand what points of vulnerability are that when they are hit have the potential to unleash cascading effects throughout the system that create overall price instability. In fact, while Milton Friedman was of the opinion that um, relative price changes can never have anything to do with inflation, Leon Tief was holding the exact opposite position. So in 1974, he was saying, as a matter of fact, the problem of inflation cannot be dealt with in aggregative terms either. If you had inflation in which all prices and incomes move in parallel, nobody would care. Actual inflation is a change in relative prices, not just in the average price level. And once we look at inflation from this perspective that foregrounds relative price changes, then of course, specific prices become relevant. I should add as a qualifying statement that I do think um, that um, asset price inflation does not quite fit um, the Leontiefian description that I'm presenting here. If we focus on a change in relative prices, then this also means that inflation comes about with immediate, immediate redistributive um, implications because these changes in relative prices affect um, all sorts of different ages in the economy differently. This is based on the assumption that there's a downward stickiness of prices, which implies that the increase in some prices is not compensated by the decrease in some other prices, but instead that these increases in prices in some areas of the economy increase costs elsewhere and thus create cost push pressure. Higher levels of inflation from this perspective then can follow from shocks to important sectors, and the question becomes which are the sectors that matter most. So the research question that I'm addressing, um, to put this in concise terms, if inflation is not always and everywhere a macroeconomic phenomenon, but can be unleashed by microeconomic shocks on the supply side, we need to identify which sectors present points of vulnerability for monetary stability, or in other words, have the greatest potential to become syst systemically significant for inflation. We are addressing this question in a recent working paper with a title that's very similar to the title of my presentation. And this is joint work with my student, Jesus Lara, um, Lucas Tejera, and Luisa Nassif Pires, who are both from Brazil. The approach that we are taking in this paper is to first um, construct a Leontief price model, which has 72 sectors um, as the, the input output table that is available from the BA as 72 sectors. We then simulate the inflation impact of a price shock to each sector within this model separately, where we assume that um, when, when the costs of one, sorry, when the prices of one sector go up, all um, sectors that are using this sector's output as an input will pass on the cost increase um, in their output prices. We shock these sectors first with the average price volatilities before the pandemic, then with the price movements in the COVID pandemic, and um, as I said, we assume full pass-through. We rank the sectors based on this, these shocks, um, um, considering their inflation impact to identify their latent systemically significance, um, which would correspond to the average price volatilities, and they realized systemically, sorry, systemical significance in the COVID pandemic, which would correspond to this second set of price shocks. This slide is designed for you to not be able to read it because I want you to focus on the distribution that I'm showing you here first. So on the left-hand side, we would have the um, total inflation impacts by sector um, for the using the, the price volatility before the pandemic um, as the magnitude of the shock. In the middle, we are using the price change in the fourth quarter of 2021 as shock. Um, so we are capturing 
the post shutdown um, phase of the inflation. And on the very right hand side, we are using the second quarter of 2022 annual price change um, as the magnitude of the shock. So we are capturing um, the, the, the very first phase of the Ukraine war. So um, what you can see here is that some industries really matter much more than others. There's no reason within our model why um, not every industry could have the same impact. So in theory, each of these bars um, could have the exact same length, but what we see is that it's really about eight to 10 sectors that matter much more than others. If we zoom into this ranking and first consider the latent systemic significance, namely shocks that correspond to the sectoral price volatility in 2000 to 2019, this is what we get. The yellow bar here represents the direct effect of a price change of this sector on the CPI, and the purple part represents the indirect effect that comes through our input-output model. There are basically eight sectors that show up in all of our simulations, also when we use different um, assumptions instead of full pass-through um, uh, adjustments of, um, of uh, lost real wages or adjustments of profit rates to keep the profit rate stable. And namely, these sectors are petroleum and coal products, oil and gas extraction, farms, food and beverage and tobacco products, chemical products, housing, utilities, and wholesale trade. You might notice that there's one sector here that is called Federal Reserve Banks, credit intermediation and related activities. Probably no economist would doubt that the price of money, namely the interest rate, is systemically significant, but I have my doubts about the representation of this sector in the input-output model, so I wouldn't be giving too much um, uh, 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 emphasis to the results um, for this specific sector. This is now the results for quarter four in 2021, and you can see that, of course, the magnitude increases quite dramatically but it's still the same kind of sectors with one exception, namely motor vehicles and parts dealers, which um, of course everybody knows about the chip shortages and the very pandemic specific um, situation that emerged in this sector. Finally, for the second quarter in 2022, it's again the same set of sectors, but now the new um, one on this list would be truck transportation which um, I think is entering um, this list because of the very high price increase of um, around 25%, um, percent, um, which um, resulted from a combination of uh, price increases in response to trucker shortages and the increased um, uh, gas and oil, sorry, gasoline prices. In this model, we basically we, we basically have three pathways um, to systemic significance. One pathway to systemic significance would be if a sector has very high um, price volatility. I'm talking here about the latent systemic significance. So this would be any sectors that are above the horizontal gray line, which indicates the average price volatility um, uh, in, 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 in the period 2000 to 2019 across these 72 sectors. You can see here that oil and gas um, extraction, petroleum and coal products are particularly volatile, um, and, but also have forward linkages that are above the average, which would be the vertical line. On the other hand, for example, wholesale trade becomes systemically significant, not because of its high um, price volatility, but because of its um, very high number of um, forward linkages. Finally, housing, the ways in which this sector is constructed in the input-output um, table does not um, have a, 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 a lot of forward linkages because it's basically measuring final consumption of housing, but it's nevertheless um, uh, systemically significant simply because of its very high weight in the CPI. So we have three pathways, high weight in, in the CPI, or in other words, something is very important for people's consumption, high price volatility, which can coincide with, um, with um, upstreamness, and finally, upstreamness. If we look at this from a more intuitive kind of perspective, I think we can say that there are three groups of systemically significant sectors, namely basic necessities, which are housing, food, 
farms, utilities, petroleum and gas products. Secondly, basic production inputs such as petroleum and gas products, oil and gas extraction, chemical products. And finally, something like the basic infrastructure of circulation, in particular, wholesale trade. But we also see that utilities, petroleum and gas products, oil and gas extraction are all energy sectors and farms, um, again, are also pretty energy intensive and chemical products are also pretty energy intensive. So I think that this underpins what Jamie already said, um, that um, energy prices are just incredibly important for overall price stability. In a second paper that has been just published in the same um, issue of the Review of Keynesian Economics that Jamie mentioned, um, which is titled Sellers, Inflation, Profits and Conflict, we are asking why can large firms hike prices in an emergency? If we think of the inflation process as one where out of a situation of stability, there's an initial imp impulse, which has shocks in these um, systemically important sectors, then the question becomes, how are these shocks propagated and possibly even amplified um, as they ripple through the system? If these shocks are propagated and then amplified um, as they, they, they are passed on from one sector to the next, um, and eventually inflation reaches um, uh, uh, critical levels and real wages start to fall, then there can be a conflict stage in the inflation, but in contrast to some of the recent co commentary that, for example, by Olivier Blanchard, I would um, argue that this conflict inflation is an outgrowth of the previous stages of inflation and not the actual origin of inflation. In trying to understand how this propagation and possibly even um, amplification works, we have been reviewing, on the one hand, the literature on administrative pricing, um, uh, uh, classical institutional economics, like um, the writings of um, John Kenneth Galbraith, um, but also earnings calls um, by corporations where they are in, in recent years, where they are talking about their pricing behavior. Um, and we basically, in, in summary, come up with three principles to try to capture um, the, the pricing um, behavior. First, firms typically do not lower prices because they want to prevent um, price wars, which would be a destructive form of um, competition. But they also do not tend to raise prices unless they expect that other firms do the same. In other words, they tend to stick to the pack. Secondly, there can be mechanisms other than formal cartels or norms of price leadership, which are of course acknowledged um, to um, uh, be institutions that can coordinate price hikes, um, which are sector-wide cost increases that can function as a coordinating mechanism for price hikes within one industry if all firms um, uh, are setting their prices based on the same principle, namely that they pr protect their profit margin. And they know that other firms also set prices to protect their profit margins, then they expect other firms to respond to cost shocks um, by increasing their prices. And namely, they, they can increase prices in kind of a safe way without, um, without risking to lose market shares. Firms that do not follow this rule can also be penalized by financial investors, as the case of Walmart illustrates. Thirdly, if demand outstrips existing capacity by a wide margin, which can be because of a supply or in some cases also a demand shock, if you think of, for example, hand disinfectants in the beginning of the pandemic, firms can gain temporary monopoly powers, which allow them to hike prices in ways that increase profit margins. Absent such a temporary mo monopoly, um, profits uh, firms are usually only able to increase profit margins by lower costs, by lowering costs, which would have been the dynamic before the pandemic. However, I would add to these three principles that um, even after um, a bottleneck has ceased to exist, and even after a cost shock um, starts to um, uh, peter out, there can be kind of an afterlife of these price hikes because there can be some sort of a new agreement across, um, across firms in a sector 
that um, hiking prices is what they do. In the paper, we have a number of um, firm level um, case studies that illustrate um, how prices have shot up in ways that have increased profits and profit margins. And prices have often kept increasing even when um, uh, volumes started to fall, which is inconsistent um, with the idea that this is simply a demand driven kind of price hike. We can also see in earnings calls that um, corporate leaders are very much aware that emergencies present um, wonderful opportunities to increase prices. So for example, in an earnings call of Dow, Dow Chemicals, um, the, the, an analyst is asking, do you think there's enough supply disruption to, due to winter storm Elliot to kind of rebalance the polyethanol market and move higher from here? And the corporate representative is, replying, I think there has been enough, obviously, to give good momentum to these price increases in the first quarter. And so I think we will see the margins expand, as I mentioned earlier, on one of the other questions. Um, this is just one example specifically around the winter storm um, Elliot, but there are plenty of these kind of examples where um, uh, uh, corporations are explicitly acknowledging that emergencies present a pretext to hike prices. Oil, I don't have to cover because Jamie already um, uh, talked about this. Um, but even in the like more consumer phasing part um, of the economy, um, we, we get um, a lot of explicit acknowledgements of how initial um, cost shocks are amplified and even propagated by firms pricing decisions. Here's an example of PepsiCo where um, the corporate representative is saying, how we are going to deal with pricing in the coming months, I would say, obviously, same as everybody else. We are seeing inflation in our business across many of our raw ingredients and some of our inputs. We are working with our partners to make the right decisions in pricing to keep the consumers with us whilst we improve our margins. So um, if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, again, you have blue for the effective volume and um, orange for um, the effective net pricing. And you can see that prices go up more when volumes decrease. So firms are really pricing to protect their profit margins. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing with time, um, but here, here's another interesting example, which is Procter & Gamble, which I think looks more like a propagation rather than an amplification, but brings out another interesting principle, namely that firms um, think about demand um, in a very kind of flexible way they think demand as a portfolio rather than a given number. So for example, Procter & Gamble is saying we are better positioned for dealing with an inflation environment than we have ever been before, starting with a portfolio that is focused on daily use categories, health, hygiene, and cleaning that are essential to the consumer versus discretionary categories, which in these environments are the first ones to lose focus from the consumer. In other words, since Procter & Gamble is um, selling all the consumer essentials, stuff like toothpaste, shampoo, soap, um, uh, uh, laundry detergent, and so on, that you cannot go without. They are confident that they can increase prices without losing demand. Um, in sum, this kind of pricing behavior has driven a profit margin explosion that started in 2021 and has now started to be um, commonly acknowledged and that it has reached levels that we haven't seen since the transition from a war economy to the post-war economy in 47, which incidentally, I think was probably the kind of inflation that most closely resembled the dynamic that we have been seeing today. From a distributional perspective, it's pretty clear that um, profits have captured larger parts of inflation than wages, which means that eventually labor will react um, to the lost ground and will try to fight back. But the conflict is then, as I said, an outgrowth growth of the previous dynamic rather than the origin of this inflation. In conclusion, if price shocks become systemic, it is not feasible to react with right hike, rate hikes and macroeconomic tightening each time a shock hits a systemically significant sector. So even if you were, despite all good reason, of the opinion that macroeconomic tightening is the way to deal with inflation, I would argue that if you already had a pandemic and you ha already had a war, 
and you're already almost in a recession and you're already at the brink of a banking crisis and then another shock hit, um, what are you going to do? Are you just going to keep um, increasing interest rates or don't we need to think about economic stabilization in a new kind of way? So I would argue that economic stabilization in the age of overlapping emergencies needs economic policy disaster preparedness so that shocks in systemically significant sectors can be absorbed where they hit. This requires a change in mindset and monitoring capacity for these sectors, as well as institutions and laws for emergency price management, which can involve buffer stocks, regulation of financial speculation, minimum inventory requirements and prohibition of holding in emergencies, prohibition of price gouging and limits to price hikes in emergencies, investments and a standby authority for emergency price stabilization in these very sectors. Finally, and this is possibly the most provocative point here, if systemically significant sectors are so important that they can unsettle the whole economy, we might need to reconsider the role of public and private stakeholders. Let's not forget that central banks as the stabilizers of interest rates, clearly a systemically significant price were once purely private. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Isabella, for the alternative perspective of uh, inflation, linking it with the input output, and um, also developing these stages of the inflation process. So Randy Ray is, um, is the next uh, panelist, uh, who is a, a more than 30 years colleague of mine, um, the Levy Institute's senior scholar and a professor of economics at Bard, and just recently completed a visiting professor at Willamette. Uh, so, Randy. Okay. Here we go. And um, Yeva is the co presenter. Uh, I'll do the slides and she will handle difficult questions afterwards. Since we're coming last, I Pretty much everything I'm going to say has been covered. Um, so I will make some linkages to previous talks. Uh, whoops. Um, so uh, first, uh, MMT has long suffered from this um, belief that it ignores inflation, that it just recommends uh, spending without limit uh, and um, supposedly uh, that is not going to be inflationary. Uh, in fact, MMT from the very beginning has always emphasized that we're limited by real resources, we're limited by uh, technical know-how, we may be politically limited, but we are not financially uh, limited. Um, spending more than our real capacity can handle can be inflationary. As um, Congressman Yarmouth, the head of the, um, the House Banking, uh, sorry, <laughs> Budget Committee, uh, emphasized in um, a very nice C-SPAN interview, uh, that the, the way we need to think about this is that spending has to be resourced. That is, you got to find the real resources rather than financed. Finance is not a problem for a sovereign government. Um, so uh, what Yeva and I have done in the past is to argue that if we're going to talk about a Green New Deal or if we're going to talk about uh, Build Back Better, uh, we need to account for the real resources. Let's find the resources, um, find uh, whether we have enough, and then phase the programs in consistent with our capacity. We also would take a functional finance approach to taxation. Uh, what you want to do is withdraw private demand in order to prevent competition that would lead to inflation. Not all taxes are created equally. And uh, this morning, there was discussion of uh, by uh, Michaelis of uh, modeling a big tax increase on high-income people in order to uh, uh, offset spending of something like a Build Back Better uh, and, you know, it's very interesting because that makes our point for us that um, you can raise a, an awful lot of tax revenue without necessarily reducing any spending and releasing any resources. 
So we need to think about which kinds of taxes actually would release the resources that we need. Okay, but anyway, the claim after the uh, pandemic was that, well, we tried MMT, uh, we just printed up money and we mailed checks to everybody. And uh, it seems to have caused inflation. Uh, so MMT was wrong. There actually is an inflation limit. So the mainstream view is that inflation is mostly a demand side problem. Slow growth is mostly a supply side problem. So before COVID, we had Larry Summers and Paul Krugman <clears throat> for almost a decade worrying about secular stagnation and coming up with all sorts of supply side arguments as to why our economy was not growing faster. Now we have the opposite problem. Uh, supposedly excessive COVID relief uh, caused the demand side problem. And Larry Summers has been banging that drum for a very long time. The reality is that inflation is uh, almost exclusively a supply side problem. What we have suffered from over the past 50 years is chronically insufficient aggregate demand because of neoliberalism that depressed domestic investment, um, which does lead to uh, depression of your supply side capacity, but we never even reached that depressed capacity because demand was too low. Uh, we came to rely on imports and very complicated global supply chains, which helped to keep uh, prices low. But when COVID hit, the supply side collapsed, and we ended up with the sharpest, deepest recession since the Great Depression. However, the COVID response of trillions of dollars led to the fastest recovery ever, which does make the point that Warren Moser always makes, which is that there is no uh, recession so deep that a fiscal policy response cannot bring you out of it. However, that spending was not well targeted. Um, Powell's initial response uh, was the correct response. Uh, patience was uh, called for. However, the COVID disruptions continued for far longer than expected. Uh, this was partly due to a bungled response to COVID in our country and also in others. Uh, and some of that bungling was due to the, uh, the development of just-in-time production, neoliberal supply chains, and so on, that all got um, broken up with um, the uh, response to COVID and China's uh, lockdowns and continued lockdowns for many, many months. In addition, we've had price gouging and I, I liked Isabella's uh, presentation. I disagreed with what Dan said this morning. Um, we, we obviously have price gouging. All we have to do is listen to the CEOs as they proudly uh, announce at their board meetings that consumers are not going to punish us for price gouging. Okay, and then, of course, the Ukraine war. So all of these have conspired to produce uh, high inflation. The problem was not COVID relief, which ended months ago. Uh, the, many people have mentioned this before. That first round of COVID relief was saved or used to pay down um, bills. I agree with uh, Jamie that um, uh, this had very beneficial impacts uh, for uh, the majority of Americans. The second round started to get spent, but it was spent in very unusual ways, mostly on goods that uh, could be delivered to your front door. Um, and so we did get some bottlenecks and we got some um, price hikes and we had uh, some uh, mega corporations taking advantage where they could. Meantime, the economy recovered, uh, tax revenue boomed. That tax revenue was sucking demand out of the economy. And uh, I was starting to worry that we were headed toward recession long before the Fed even uh, started to raise interest rates for reasons that Michaelis was talking about this morning. Looking at the sectoral balances, you could see the budget deficit declining sharply. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, we were importing more as supply chains got uh, back underway, which meant that our private sector is getting squeezed. So most likely we were headed toward a downturn uh, like Michaelis, I don't put a, a date on that because what we learned uh, back in 1999 is the economy 
once it gets moving in one direction, uh, can continue in that direction much longer than you think that it can. So anyway, the Fed, by raising interest rates, uh, added headwinds that had already been created by tightening fiscal policy. What's the view from the Fed? Uh, so as Jamie argued, uh, they abandoned Friedman's quantity theory, the idea that money causes inflation, and in the early 1990s started to uh, build this new view of inflation that came to be called later the new monetary consensus and a new policy, which was uh, the Taylor rule. If you read the minutes, the transcripts from the, the Fed's meetings during that period, which I did, you could see that even before uh, economists had embraced the new monetary consensus, the Fed had already embraced a uh, practical version of the new monetary consensus under Greenspan in the early 90s. So what is that view? It's the view that expectations of inflation cause inflation. There's not much discussion. You cannot really good, get a good idea of how the Fed thinks this occurs, uh, but it seems to be sort of um, uh, the Peter, Peter Pan uh, fairy dust uh, explanation. Policy works by controlling expectations, but how do you control expectations? Uh, Jamie mentioned forward guidance. So you're supposed to control those through forward guidance, but how is that done? Well, you move the Fed funds rate to move the real rate to the natural rate. This is a different natural rate. It's the natural rate of interest, but it's consistent with that NIRU. Uh, even people inside the Fed have trouble with this. Uh, Tarullo said, the Fed has no theory of inflation. And Jeremy Rudd, a researcher at the Fed, said, nobody thinks clearly, no matter what they pretend. Even the goofiest opinion seems wonderfully clear, sane, and self-evident. So Dimitri and I, back in 1994, uh, started looking at um, the, what the Fed said it was doing and um, titled that first uh, paper, Flying Blind. Uh, we had a, a second one in 96 and then more recently uh, in 21. And what we argue is the Fed is focusing on triple unobservables, three things that you cannot, cannot really observe. Inflation expectations. Yes, we have some surveys, but interestingly, they don't actually survey those who actually determine prices. Uh, real interest rates, which is a compound term, can never be observed. And finally, the natural rate, which Greenspan uh, admitted. We don't know what that is, but trust us, if we ever get there, we will know it. So policies reduced to psyops. It's psychological game, gamesmanship. Uh, which we've written about in these earlier pieces, that is to influence emotions, motives, and objective reasoning. Okay, so expectations cause inflation. Uh, so if we look at uh, inflation expectations, whether long-term or short-term, you can see that since uh, 2012, they've been perfectly horizontal. Meanwhile, the inflation rate has been up and down, but in a fairly narrow range until the current high inflation period. The point is, we don't see expectations rising, causing inflation. What we see is that after many months of inflation, expectations start to very gradually rise. So I've always argued expectations converge to reality rather than the other way around. Um, but OK, so the expectations didn't cause it. Uh, the central bank has to take away the punch bowl, as the Fed has been saying since the days of uh, Richard Nixon. Um, so the idea is when the government spends too much, the central bank has to reduce demand. And certainly the government spent too much in COVID relief. So it's the central bank's job to reduce demand. Too much government spending increases the deficit and the debt, and that raises interest rates the crowding out theory, and causes inflation. But as we can show, and we do show in our paper in more detail than I will right now, the Fed raises rates going into recession. The Fed raises rates as the deficit falls. The Fed uh, raises rates, sorry <laughs> for a typo, even when there is no inflation. Interest rates are determined by monetary policy, not by deficits. Uh, the, the government deficit debt uh, ratio uh, rising is not associated necessarily with rising inflation. 
And our high inflations are always driven by the supply side. So I'm only going to present a few of the um, uh, graphs with data that we have in uh, the two papers that I cited at the top. So here is um, the, the Fed's rate target. Uh, here is the uh, deficit. Below the line, of course, the deficit is getting bigger. And what we see is the Fed consistently raises interest rates as the deficit declines or moves to a surplus as it did during the Clinton years. Okay, why is that? Well, it's because the uh, as the economy uh, reaches uh, the, the peak of the business cycle, it sucks so much um, demand, uh, the, sorry, government taxes suck so much demand out of the economy that we start moving uh, toward uh, 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 more balanced budget. And that's exactly the time that the Fed always raises interest rates. Fed rate hikes aren't closely associated with inflation. So here we have relatively stable inflation uh, since 1990. And we have the Fed actively fighting something, but it's clearly not fighting inflation until the, uh, the last couple of months. When does the Fed raise rates? It raises rates when unemployment reaches the bottom. So it's pretty clear that the Fed is raising rates in order to cause unemployment and a recession. What's the source of current inflation? Okay, we've already had a number of presentations uh, today that have pointed to the same three elements. And what Dimitri and I showed in the earlier pieces is that this was just as true in the early 1970s, that high inflation period. Also in the late 70s, early 80s, it was the same three items. It's always the same three items in the case of the United States, oil, food, and shelter. And uh, people have several times remarked uh, that the thing that drives shelter is imputed rentals, since we are a nation of homeowners. Uh, it is as if we are uh, paying rent to ourselves, and we're finding that increasingly more difficult to do uh, because those rentals are going up. Uh, that is now accounting for about two percentage points of the four to five percentage points inflation that we have. Uh, energy is now down sharply, but in all three of our high inflation periods, energy was the initial driver. We also have um, price gouging. We have rising markups. Okay, that's been discussed uh, uh, plenty. Jamie talked about the, the problem in the auto industry. And now it's food, and we heard uh, that it is both um, uh, food at home and uh, food in restaurants. Well, what is food? Food is just oil with a lag. Uh, food prices are 70% determined by oil. And some services, perhaps uh, some of that is at the, the lower end of the uh, service sector uh, pay scales where wages had to rise to attract workers into basically dangerous uh, jobs. Um, and so that's not necessarily something that we should be fighting in any case. There's still no evidence of a wage price spiral. Patience was the best policy. Raising rates is not helpful. Uh, as Michaela said, spending is not interest sensitive. Uh, consumers don't normally borrow to finance their purchases at, at the gas tank, uh, at the gas station or um, at the grocery store. Although unfortunately, some people now that the pandemic relief has run out actually are running up their credit cards to pay for food. Uh, and uh, raising interest rates so that they, they cannot uh, buy food doesn't seem like a very good policy prescription. Uh, raising rates hurts the supply of housing. We have a severe shortage of housing across the country, and raising rates um, will uh, impact uh, not only the housing turnover, but also housing construction. Um, and then we have two uh, counterproductive impacts of raising rates. One is uh, the cost feed through. If you ask any economist, uh, if you increase the price of oil, what do you get? Inflation. Uh, if you increase the price of, say, uh, commercial rentals, uh, what do you get? Inflation. If you increase the price of interest rates, uh, what do you get? Deflation. <laughs> Why? It's a major cost of doing business. 
And then also the interest income uh, avenue that uh, also was discussed earlier this morning. Okay, so the answer to supply side inflation is not to reduce demand, but to increase supply. Demand has not outstripped capacity. You've already seen some data on that. Uh, it is still well within potential capacity that we could have expected. Uh, in spite of low measured unemployment, labor markets are not excessively tight. Uh, sales are not above normal. PC inflation is on a downward trend. Core is already below 2%. Uh, our peak capacity, capacity utilization rates used to reach uh, well above 85% in uh, economic periods of economic growth. Uh, we've been on a downward trend, and that is even with low investment uh, during this neoliberal uh, age. Our peak capacity uh, rates uh, with each succeeding expansion are lower than the previous one. And we still are um, uh, nowhere near what used to be a common capacity utilization rate. Labor force participation rate uh, does not indicate that we have tight labor markets. There were several other graphs on this. Uh, employment cost index versus inflation, as I said, uh, wages are not driving the inflation. They're trying to play catch up, which makes sense because workers negotiate based on pre the previous periods. Uh, inflation, not what they uh, expect inflation might be. Uh, a survey of um, uh, firms of various sizes asks, uh, how, uh, how much above normal are your sales? We don't see any indication that um, they perceive sales as being above normal. Okay, to conclude, um, the Fed has taken credit for the low inflation in the U.S. since Volcker. In reality, that low inflation has been primarily due to the use of globalized supply chains and cheap labor abroad, low costs of regulations and taxes abroad, uh, the switch to just-in-time production, holding low or no inventories, which came back to bite us in the pandemic, austerity and stagnating demand, jobless recoveries, which was mentioned uh, earlier today. These same factors that tamed inflation uh, are now causing problems. Volcker was given credit. Uh, he raised rates above 20%, caused a deep recession. I think people uh, have forgotten how serious that problem was, led to a series of financial crises a decade of lost development in Latin America, which also came back to hit the United States uh, because we held a lot of Latin American debt. And full recovery took 25 years. Uh, Larry Summers, however, says, I'm aware of no major example in which the central bank reacted with excessive speed uh, to inflation, a large cost was paid. I, I think maybe he means that he personally faced no cost of the rapid hike of rates. Fed's latest projections under appropriate monetary policy, as it was stated, Americans can now expect to be 3% poorer at the end of 23 compared to what had been projected before the pandemic and to remain permanently worse off in the years that follow compared to the June 21 projections. Uh, real GDP for this year has been marked down by 5.5%, worse than the hit from the pandemic. Policymakers expect unemployment to rise to at least 4.4% by the end of 23. And if you remember, Summer says it is going to take five years of 6%, two years of 7.5%, or one year of 10% unemployment in order to whip inflation. Powell says we need to have a sharp slowdown in growth. Fed officials would accept a lot of economic pain. I presume they mean other people's pain. That pain is spreading around the world already. Others have to follow the Fed rate hikes to minimize pressure on their exchange rates and therefore on their domestic inflation. Okay, conclusion, MMT has not ignored inflation. It's always emphasized real resource constraints. Pandemic policy was not an MMT policy. Current inflation is not really demand driven. Uh, the government stimulus was finished long ago. The Fed can't do much about inflation anyway. It's not a monetary phenomenon. Fiscal policy is more appropriate. Uh, address bottlenecks, invest in particular sectors, 
punish price gougers with tax hikes and so on. And Isabella had a nice list of other policies to, to complement these. So I will stop there. Thank you, Randy, very, very much. Uh, before we go to the q and I'd like to ask uh, Gabor Nyoshizian, who is a professor at Franklin and Marshall and a member of the Levy family, if she has anything to add. Um, I'm just happy to answer questions, but one thing I guess I could say is that uh, even the Fed seems to recognize that inflation is a supply side problem. Uh, there was a headline in the New York Times which said congressional Republicans are blaming the stimulus for inflation. The Fed chair disagrees. He says it's because of supply disruptions. So, you know, if you're recognizing that it's supply driven and you're also saying that we can't do much about demand and yet you're going to still try to lower demand, I think that's a big contradiction there. Okay, so let's take some of the questions. There is a question from an anonymous attendee who says that if higher nominal interest rates are largely uh, ineffective in dealing with everyday inflation due to various reasons, what then is the appropriate policies to mitigate everyday inflation as we are experiencing now? Well, I think both uh, Randy and Eva's paper and mine uh, speak to that quite directly. Uh, that in the first instance, uh, one needs to control markups and margins. Isabella talked about that. In the second instance, it's, since things are being driven by energy uh, policy, one needs to have policy to, to, to that keeps energy and other core input prices under control. Uh, and uh, and then in the third instance, uh, there, there's the pr pr the cost pressure of, of, of interest rates themselves. And as uh, Randy said wisely, uh, patience is the right policy. Uh, one could go on in this vein, but there's no simple set of policies here. You have a complex problem. You need a complex set of policies. Jamie, there's another question which I think it addresses what you said about the natural the, the target inflation target of two percent, and it says that um, even if uh, if we think that two percent inflation target is arbitrary, should it be changed at a time when inflation is high? Would it not undermine the credibility of the inflation targeting regime? Well, that's that's a argument that I first remember hearing to justify continuing the Vietnam War. And if we didn't, uh, you know, if we if we gave up and, uh, and admitted reality, we would be losing credibility. And we're hearing it again. We hear it in lots of contexts. But I, I don't know that they need to change the target. They can simply extend the date in which it's uh, at which it's to which they hope to achieve it. Say out to ten years time, uh, and then I'm I'm quite content. And that doesn't doesn't work. I, I don't I don't impose upon them to say they're actually aiming for a higher inflation target. But why do they think they need to get the thing down to two percent this year or next year at an enormous cost when we you know a reasonable proposition is that if they do the other things correctly that will simply go away over time anyway can i yes uh, sorry yeah and the fed has sort of pivoted in that direction right they have this flexible inflation targeting which uh, uh, framework which they came up with they, they were doing it before COVID, but then after COVID in August of 2020, they said, we now have this new regime where we're going to uh, try to achieve an average inflation target of 2%, right? And, and we're not going to raise interest rates preemptively. And of course, they're under attack by mainstream economists for that, right? Saying that, th that this was the mistake of the Fed. But um, in some sense, it wasn't really changing the framework. They were just trying to save save their framework because they looked at it and they said, for more than 10 years now, we haven't been able to achieve the target. We've been undershooting the target, right? But it's been below 2%. And at some point, people are going to say, wait a minute, the Fed cannot achieve the target. So then it's going to lead to an anchoring of the inflation expectations because people will lose the belief that the Fed can control inflation and they will lose their credibility. So instead they said, well, we're just gonna now pretend that, right? We are achieving the target. So some years it can be below and some years it can be above, right? 
Um, and, and that's what they did. And that's why they sort of were kind of late in raising interest rates because they said we're going to do this averaging, right? Uh, but of course, the problem was that they were still um, anchored to their own framework. They weren't really changing the framework. They were just trying to save their framework. And one question that I have for them is, so you were trying to inflate the economy for 10 years and you couldn't. And then now you're saying that fiscal stimulus very quickly did what you were trying to do for 10 years and you couldn't. Shouldn't that lead, lead us to rethink you know, which policy is more appropriate for uh, inflating or deflating the economy that it's fiscal policy that's much more powerful, right? Can I just add one thing? Uh, Google, Powell trying to justify the 2% target. It's hilarious. There is no justification for 2%. Yeah, basically, Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, uh, and forward guidance, really, I mean, they're not necessarily harmful ideas, but but one should grow out of them after a certain point. Well, you know, it also reminds me that uh, Paul Krugman and Olivia Lanchard actually have written a couple of papers calling for a target of 4%. And actually, Krugman had a target for the ECB to be 5%, which means he tells us that these, these numbers are so arbitrary. Well, perhaps, but I, I would not, if I were back on the congressional staff, I would not recommend to a member of Congress that they embrace any particular inflation target. You. Uh, you know, it, it, that would have political costs. <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> Another, qu another question from Tanwar Akram, um, who is, uh, is also in the Levy family, who asks, doesn't inflation cause inflation expectations? It seems to me that observed inflation has a big effect on consumers, forecasters, and investors' inflation, inflation's expectations, particularly for the near term. Randy and Eva's paper, Eva's paper uh, addressed that specifically. Yeah, and what Randy was saying earlier, that it's the inflation expectations that converge to inflation rather than the expectations driving inflation, right? So when people do see infl higher inflation, then they adjust their expectations. So when they're asked, what kind of inflation do you expect in the next year, especially, right, then they're going to give a higher number because they're observing more inflation. Yeah, which uh, underscores that underscores that inflation expectations are not an instrument of policy. I think it it also um, I mean it goes to what you were talking about, Jamie. You know, the, every index is a human construction. We decide what to put in there, and putting the OER in there is crazy, <laughs> and that is a big driver of inflation. So we should not have owner occupied rent in there at all. It's, it's not something that people actually pay. But if you put that in there, and so that's adding two percentage points to the inflation rate, and then every news report you hear is trumpeting the inflation rate, everyone believes it's higher than it is. That's a, that's a very excellent point. And I would add to that, and I really don't know for sure how this, it, this rental imputation is, com is, is computed, but to the extent that it's based upon actual rental markets, it's going to be based upon new rental contracts in a sector of the housing, uh, of the housing uh, uh, sector, which is, which is a relatively, uh, it's a very different qualitatively from owned housing, uh, much more volatile, much, the quality is lower, uh, much more subject to, the, to, to transient pressures. So you're looking at something, as this a thin tape wagging a very fat dog uh, here, which just strikes, I can understand why the accountants uh, came to, the, you know, did this in the first place, but it, it it simply become inappropriate to this, to the, to the conditions that we're now facing. Fair enough, Randy and, and you, so in terms of, you know. Well, it's in the, uh, the original 94 paper that Dimitri and I did. So it's there at the Levy Institute. So they used to, to put in you know, your actual costs. And then the problem was when the Fed raises interest rates, 
if you have a floating rate mortgage, it actually does feed directly into inflation. So you have the Fed directly increasing inflation. So they decided let's not do it that way. And so let's have the owner's equivalent rent. So they survey homeowners, how much do you think you could rent your home for? And then they apply the rate of increase of actual rentals, which as you said, are not similar. It's different neighborhoods, it's a very different market. They apply that to the, uh, the survey data. We have a question for Paul Shield, um, whom we know, who asked if you could change one key aspect of the legacy macroeconomic policymaking framework, no holds barred, what would it be? So I go Ooh. first. <laughs> well, I would say we should take back the Fed to what it was created for, which is to maintain financial stability. And that's very much Minsky's point that the, the original aim of why we have a central bank has been subverted because of monetarism and so on, right? That the Fed should be in charge of financial stability, asset prices, and then fiscal policy should be uh, given the prominent role for managing aggregate demand whether you're trying to fight a recession or you're trying to fight inflation, if it's demand-driven, obviously. Yeah, it's ironic. Now the Fed is maybe the biggest financial destabilizer that we have. They've already wiped out the second, third, and fourth biggest banks in the United States, and many more are going to fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just say as a personal matter that the uh, the one thing I would like to do is to go back and revisit the, this business of forward guidance, since I feel a certain historical responsibility for it. And uh, you know, it, 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 that that one is on my conscience personally, and I, uh, the, it, it, it will trouble my sleep more than even some things that might, well, as you uh, uh, just said, be more important. A question for Randy and Yeva. Uh, regarding the pandemic fiscal response, what should have been done differently? Randy said it was not targeted. So what would it be? Eva, go first. Yeah, I would say um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the assistance that went to consumers workers and so on, uh, we could target that more for sure, right? So unemployment benefits, clearly they're targeted. They're targeted to people who lost their income. So you're not basically adding additional demand. You're just restoring demand uh, to some level and hopefully to a higher level because our unemployment benefits are very stingy, right? Uh, on average, replacing like 45%. Um, some of the stimulus checks, I think, could could have been spared, right? Like I got I got stimulus. I didn't lose my job, my job, right? And so, <laughs> a lot of people like me had that. So I think that was not targeted well. Uh, partly is because we don't have a good infrastructure and a plan for what do we do in situations like this, right? So because we don't have a plan, we're like we're just gonna try to get money out, and it doesn't matter if it gets into the wrong hands sometimes. But I feel like the um, the PPP program could have been done much, much better, right? The way the Europeans did it, which they directly replaced the wages of the workers rather than giving money to firm in, in some roundabout way where banks are involved and probably taking a cut and, and you know, firms are getting it and hopefully they're giving it to workers, but who knows, right? Um, so I think we could have done it better, the PPP, we could have done it the European way uh, and maybe some of the stimulus checks, right? I mean, ideally the MMT prescription is to have a job guarantee, which could be difficult in time of a pandemic, right? So that otherwise I would say generally, the best way to do it in a targeted manner would be through a job guarantee. I want to just add, add to that. I think you're absolutely right about the PPP program, which uh, ended up causing a lot of trouble for businesses when they tried to unwind the, uh, the, the loans that they got. Um, but on the whole, um, well, I think one has to say that, you know, given the scale and the urgency uh, that, this was a remarkably um, you know, effective set of policies. Uh, 
uh, and they it was they simply blew away the, you know, the 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 notional limits that uh, economists would try to have historically played. Uh, placed on this kind of policy, this kind of emergency. Uh, and we discovered, well, at the end of the day, the results were certainly much better than many people feared. And the fears that mainstream economists uh, have been uh, pounding on for the last couple of years about the consequences for persistent inflation and so forth proved to be tough, have already proved to be unfounded. So on the whole, uh, it's you know we could have done um, we could have done better, but we also could have done a lot worse. I want to take one more question. I know we run out of time, but it's related to the job guarantee, so I think it's important. And the question it comes from Tom Clarkson, who asks how much would the implementation of a job guarantee produce in terms of a one-time increase in consumer prices. Well, we it was it 2019 when um, uh, at the Levy Institute we put out a piece co-written by a, a bunch of Levy scholars that uh, modeled this using the fair model, uh, and we I think we used fifteen dollars an hour as the wage of the program, and if I remember right, uh, there are about fifteen million employees in the program plus 4 million private sector jobs will be created by the consumption spending increase of workers in the program. And if I remember right, the uh, inflation rate increased by 0 0.07 of a percentage point. So that's what the model tells us would be the inflation impact of a job guarantee program. It's insignificant. Well, with this, I want to uh, bring the conference to a close. I want to um, certainly thank all the participants um, and those who actually participated from across the Atlantic. I want to, um, to thank the um, Lee Institute staff, especially Emily Ungvary and uh, Lindsay Carter and Michael Stevens. And um, of course, those of you who um, signed on and uh, stayed on, and those of you who signed on and signed off, but at least I hope that the presentations um, enhance your understanding of the issues that uh, the US economy is confronting, and some of the issues that are very timely and very related, such as inflation and um, employment and um, employment and uh, the measures of employment, as well as the um, ongoing challenge of how to deal with uh, the climate, climate change. So thank you very much, all of you, and um, I look forward to uh, seeing you to um, the next year's conference and other Living Institute uh, events. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.